Good evening and thank you for joining us. Thunder Bay Police are investigating a homicide on the city's south side. Officers arrived at a home on East Mary Street just before 11.30 this morning to find a woman who had died after suspected assault. Paramedics with Superior North EMS, Thunder Bay Fire Rescue and members of the OPP were also on scene today. There was still a significant police presence around 4.30 this afternoon, with officers going in and out of the building and spending time in the backyard. The identity of the victim isn't being released at this time, and police haven't said whether they've identified any suspects. The Major Crimes Unit is expected to provide an update on the homicide tomorrow afternoon. Thunder Bay City Council has put the brakes on some of the controversial service cuts recommended by administration. 22 of the 28 proposed cuts were approved, resulting in $430,000 in annual savings, but other proposals like closing Niebing Arena and 30 outdoor rinks, canceling two bus routes and scrapping the Sister Cities program have been delayed pending stakeholder consultation. Basilio Bellows reports. Thunder Bay City Council approved 22 of the 28 proposed service cuts to next year's budget, resulting in over $400,000 in savings annually. Mayor Ken Boschkov pushed for the approval of the entire list, stressing more challenging times to come. I'm going to be voting to, uh, to make these cuts now because they it's only going to get tougher as the term progresses. The list compiled by administration was based on a decision from council to find more than $2 million in savings. After significant pushback from the community, council decided to postpone a decision on five items on the list and send them out for stakeholder consultation. Those included the closure of Niebing Arena, more than 30 outdoor rinks, two bus routes, and transit service on Christmas and New Year's Day, collectively costing more than $1 million. Important to me, and I don't want to cut a single thing off this item, Chair. Not a single thing off this item. Many around the table, including Councillor Brian Hamilton, recognize the importance of these services, but stress pulling dollars from infrastructure to fund them isn't sustainable. But what happens is when we don't fix roads properly, we are spending money fixing them and fixing the sewer and water and going back again and again. Actually, it's, it's a, there's a massive hole in the bucket. And we as a council, I think, have, have an odd duty and an obligation to try to mend that. City staff currently estimate there's a $30 million infrastructure deficit. Others like Councillor Shelby Chung called the discussion a red herring that will do little to address city financial issues in the long run. It's a distraction from our real problems, like city managers. Gale said, our real problems are the ballooning costs of police, fire, EMS, the lack of, of, um, of big industry that we are propped up on, that our tax base is propped up on, is just isn't there to support us anymore. As for the five items going out for stakeholder consultation, administration has been tasked with bringing a report back to council during an August meeting. Vicilios Bellows, TVT News. City Council also took another step toward the creation of a centralized library. Council voted to have city staff look at the library's second and third options to make that happen, both of which include the closure of at least one existing branch. The more expensive option would increase library spending by $500,000 and result in the closure of the Brody branch. The less expensive option would close the Brody and County Fair locations, saving the city about $150,000. CEO Richard Togman says adding the central branch at Intercity Shopping Centre would allow the remaining branches to better tailor programming to their neighbourhood. Each library branch is uh, foundationally designed to be very similar to the others because it's designed to be providing similar library services across the community. With this different vision, we have a central library that is that main hub for the entire city and our neighbourhood branches can be really tailored to the needs of those exact neighbourhoods. I can't support option two. It's, uh, I mean, on the paper right now, it, loosely, it's a, it's a $670,000 expansion. And, um, you know, we, we know we're, we're needing to cut millions to stay at a reasonable tax increase in 2024. City staff will bring a report back to council next June.
The owner of the site of the former Finlandia building is confirming that construction won't resume until next year at the earliest. Brad McKinnon says the bottom line has changed considerably for the condo development due to higher interest rates and construction costs. But the main factor is a major legal battle against one of the contractors involved in the renovation of the former Finnish Labour Temple, who McKinnon claims caused the fire that destroyed the historic building in 2021. It's unfortunate that it's not happening this season, but there, you know, there's some very uh, good reasons behind that. You know, the first reason is that we're in a uh, major legal battle. You know, that settlement needs to take place before we continue with construction. Um, you know, there's a tight labor market in Thunder Bay. It's very hard to get large crews of contractors with the uh, skills, the know-how to, to do that kind of work. And uh, interest rates are very high right now as well. The concrete foundation and underground parking was completed last year. McKinnon says he's already invested about $3.5 million into the reconstruction project. When it's done, the building will also be home to the new Hoito restaurant on the main floor. McKinnon says he hopes to restart construction next year, if the lawsuit is resolved by then. And he wants to reassure the community that he will see the project through to completion. You know, the Finlandia will be rebuilt. And it will be a legacy building that will stand, you know, for another hundred years. Like I said, that our intentions are sincere to to rebuild what was lost. That I urge people to to be patient and understand the current situation. The Nuclear Waste Management Organization hosted a public meeting at the CAM Community Centre yesterday evening. But the presentation the NWMO had prepared quickly turned into a town hall style Q&A with residents and nuclear waste site opponents demanding answers to their concerns. Carl Legden reports. The NWMO had booked CAMS Community Centre on the invitation of a member of the public, but opposition groups raised the alarm over what they say was a lack of public notice about a public open house. In response, the NWMO told us the request for the session did not leave them with enough time to publicize the event. Members of nuclear waste opposition groups caught wind of the event and quickly notified their list of local supporters, leading to a showing of at least 50 members of the public. Our um, organization is um, concentrating on the hazards of transporting and burying the waste. It will be transported a minimum of 1,600 kilometres one way by truck and possibly by train into northwestern Ontario if the site was selected. You know, that's an awfully long way for critically hazardous waste, like very hazardous waste, to be traveling. The NWMO is planning to announce a preferred site for an underground nuclear waste repository in 2024, either near Ignis or in South Bruce near Lake Huron. NWMO officials emphasize their perspective that the transportation process and waste containers have undergone rigorous testing and that a misunderstanding of the waste itself has led to misunderstandings. The fuel that we're talking about is a solid. It's not a liquid, it's not a green goo, it is actually a solid at, at the end of the day. Hayo also noted that the problem of dealing with nuclear waste is one that society as a whole inevitably has no choice but to deal with. The problem doesn't go away just because we don't want it, right? Uh, it is down at the uh, reactor facilities, it's there, it has to be dealt with. It's been sitting there since the uh, early 60s and it's time to deal with it. A sentiment that was certainly not lost on attendee Barry Wolfram. There's a lot of not in my backyard, but if everybody in everybody's backyard says the same thing, we don't take responsibility for the problem. Ignace people who are considering this are considering being heroes. Somebody's got to take a responsibility. They're stepping up, maybe. The NWMO say they plan to host more public events in the future, and promise to share details with the community well in advance. Carl Langdon, TBT News. Can Canada's biggest city has a new mayor. Olivia Chow came out on top of a record-setting field of 102 candidates in Monday's May oral by-election in the city of Toronto. Chow, who's also the widow of late federal NDP leader Jack Layton, becomes the first person of colour to be elected as Toronto's mayor. Natalie Johnson reports. Arriving at her victory party and set to make her political comeback. Olivia Chow took the stage last night as Toronto's next mayor. If you ever doubted what's possible together? If you, 
If you ever questioned your faith in a better future and what we can do with each other, for each other, tonight is your answer. Promising to build a caring and more affordable city, a new chapter ahead. My heart is full because it's so exciting to be given this opportunity to serve, to work with others. This morning, telling CP24 that her first priority in office will be expediting housing. There are some social housing uh, from nonprofit organizations. They have been waiting for two years to get approved. So they got the money, they got the land, they, they got the building, everything's ready. They just need the approvals, shuffle can hit the ground. So I'm gonna say, come on, let's mm -hmm. get this moving. Facing questions about how she'll fund her campaign promises, how high she might raise property taxes. Modest, we, but looking at um, nine months from now, right? right? Mm -hmm. uh, about that. Uh, so lots will happen between then. What we need to do is come together and say to uh, the provincial and the federal government say, hey, this is a big city. This is the heart economic engine of Canada. Olivia wants to get into that conversation about how do we make Torontonians' lives better? What are the things we need to invest in? It can't just be about it's a 2%, 5%, 6, whatever the number is, because that's how you actually end up in the situation we're in with a billion and a half dollar hole in the city of Toronto budget. Chow inherits a full agenda at City Hall where council continued during the by-election campaign with little time for a honeymoon. The budget is going to start to come up pretty quick. We'll see collective agreements come up pretty quick and whether she's going to move over to the union side. Um, uh, we see, we're going to see things like bike lanes come up on Young Street. Mm. You know, what's she going to do about that? But, but what we're... Toronto's new progressive mayor set to officially take over in two weeks' time. Natalie Johnson, CTV News. The number of young Ontarians who died of drug overdoses tripled from 2014 to 2021. This is at the same time that drug treatment rates were being significantly decreased. A new report found that 752 young people died, 711 were hospitalized, and more than 5,400 had to make visits to emergency departments during that seven-year period. Researchers also found that the use of medication to treat opioid use disorder fell by 50%, and in-person treatment fell 73% over the same time frame. The authors are calling for more harm reduction options and to address some of the systemic problems that could be at the root of opioid use. The Ontario government is investing nearly $1.7 million into the Thunder Bay area projects through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. Thunder Bay Atacokan MPP Kevin Holland made the announcement today at the site of one of the six organizations that get, that's getting that money. Mitchell Ringos has more. Six economic development projects in the Thunder Bay region received nearly $1.7 million from the NOHFC. Local MPP Kevin Holland was at Secure Orbit on Alloy Drive to announce the funding, which included over $293,000 for a new lathe, robotic welding cell and powder coating equipment. Secure Orbit Vice President Phil Tremblay says it gives them a huge helping hand to expand and maintain their company. And we've also expanded into the second yard, which really allows our production facility here to focus 100% on manufacturing and our construction division to focus on their, on their goal, uh, which is obviously installing fences and doors throughout the, uh, the region. Also receiving funding is the municipality of Shunya, which received $700,000 to build a pavilion this summer over the outdoor skating area at the McGregor Recreation Center near Wild Goose Park. Shunya Councillor and Acting Mayor Don Smith attended the funding announcement in Thunder Bay and spoke about the big impact this project will have. It's huge. I mean, the, the activities that go on in that place are absolutely unbelievable. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And now with this pavilion, it just kind of gives us an opportunity to you know, make it even a bigger hub and you know, make it you know, just the area, the community where, where things happen. So it, it's a huge, huge thing for us. Holland says since June of 2018, the NOHFC has invested more than $685 million into over 5,500 projects in Northern Ontario, 
leveraging more than $2.3 billion in investment and creating or sustaining over 9,000 jobs. And the fact that Northern Ontario Heritage Fund is helping these businesses sustain their operations, but more importantly, and in most cases, growing their operations, it is really exciting and it's just increasing the opportunities and the, uh, the benefit to Northern Ontario. Also receiving funding was Termax, which received over $300,000, North Rock Engineering, which was given over $50,000, LaCroix Aquaponics, which got over $190,000, and One Women's North with over $138,000. Mitchell Ringos, TBT News. Five people suffered smoke inhalation, including two who needed to be hospitalized after they entered a burning home to save their dog. Firefighters were called to a kitchen fire in a Frederica Street home yesterday. The occupants were near the home but not inside when the fire broke out. They were alerted to the blaze when they heard the smoke alarms going off. Everyone, including the dog, made it out safely, but firefighters are reminding people never to enter a burning building for any reason. The fast food chicken game has some new competition in the city as Mary Brown's Chicken has opened its new Thunder Bay location on West Arthur Street. After a soft launch yesterday, the local franchise opened its doors to the public for the first time today. District Manager Dave Patrician says the drive through location in front of Arthur Street Marketplace offers a lot of space in proximity to residential neighbourhoods, the airports and hotels. Thunder Bay used to have three Mary Brown locations back in the 1980s and 90s. Patrician says he's heard from some who say the Canadian fast food outlet's return brings back some good memories. This company started in 1969 in, in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador and uh, there's so many people in Thunder Bay that I've met from St. John's and to have all those warm fuzzy memories of Mary Brown's and we're just bringing a little taste of home to them right here in Thunder Bay. The Thunder Bay location has more than 50 employees.